I used to ride a motorcycle as a sole method of transportation when I was studying, and I used to work on hotel cocktail bars during the summer holidays. Six years ago, I was working at a historic, stereotypically grand hotel in a very rural area of the UK. I worked a long afternoon and evening into the night, finishing cleaning up the bar around 2am and walked through the underbelly of the hotel to retrieve my motorcycle and make the journey home. I can still clearly remember the feeling of the crisp night air and the absolute pitch black silence of the countryside after the hot and seemingly never ending nights of serving drinks to diner goers and party goers and whatnot. It was always sort of um, intensely relaxing. Now that being an adult meant not being scared of the dark or being outside on a motorcycle in the middle of nowhere at 2am that is. Riding through the local town took me a few minutes before I left to follow the dark country roads home. At this point I rode a Honda 125cc, around 11 horsepower, a basic and old but clean and it did the job, regardless of its quirks such as the dim headlight which would dim and flicker even more when coming to a stop. But I was riding along these pitch black roads with fields and woods surrounding me, very much alone for 20 minutes. But then I saw a brief blast of bright blue headlights in my mirrors coming from behind me. Moments later, dazzling headlights arrived behind me in seconds. Almost immediately, a large Range Rover pulls out to overtake me, blasting past barely inches away from me. I respond with a long blast of my horn. And that was a big mistake. The Range Rover pulls in front and slams on the anchors in what seemed like an attempt to have me lose control under sudden braking or rear end the Range Rover. Bikes can, even when they're old and really on drum brakes, stop pretty quickly so I didn't rear end into the maniac in front. I came to a controlled stop, I see the door of the range crack open and a figure begins to step out. I went for it though, using all 11 HP of this little Honda's power, pulling an overtake. However, in those moments, this anger-crazed maniac had shut his door and stepped on the accelerator, causing us to be level and accelerating together when I reached his car. He then started to run me off the road, pulling me to the right, wedging me further over toward the ditch at the side of the road. And this is where I ended up struggling to control the bike on the wet, dew heavy grass around the side of the road, trying to stop the 140 kilo motorcycle dropping into the ditch. I struggled to regain balance, but managed to pull the bike back onto the road. At this point, I noticed the guy had got back out of the Range Rover, and walked around the back, opened it, and was reaching inside for something. I had turned the bike to face the other side of the road, ready to turn either way and make an escape from the escalating situation. And just as I looked to turn, I took one more look over at him to see him pulling a large long object out of the back of the range. Again, I just went for it, taking another glance over my shoulder after 200 meters to see that he'd begun to continue driving up the road, away from where I'd run off the road. I slowed down to see what he'd do next, after driving away from me. He reached the top of the road and pulled over to the left, kind of waiting for me I think the lights reflecting on the road. And man, it was eerie. My heart was beating so fast, but it felt like time had stopped. I just carried on in the opposite direction to find an alternative route home in the pitch black. And just before doing this, I checked my phone for signal to see that I had no mobile coverage whatsoever. Over the summer, me, my fiancé and my stepdaughter, then two years old, went on a vacation to Presk. We stayed there throughout the afternoon and decided to get dinner in a nearby town. We go there and see a water fountain that kids can play in and we think our kid would like that, so we get food and take her there. Now, it was a kind of a pretty sketchy area, I'll admit. There were a lot of people that were super ghetto face tattoos and looking pretty high but there were also kids and it was still a little light out like 6 30 or 7 p.m ish me and my fiance sit down and watch our kid play for a bit and at some point our kid wants me to run into the water with her so i do i kind of keep going back and forth between playing with her and keeping my fiance company 
after playing with my kid for a while, I came back to my fiance. She looked kind of pale though and said, go get the kid, we have to leave right now. I didn't know what was going on, but I go and get the kid and as I was turning to go back and get her, I noticed a group of about three really weird guys just staring intently at us. When I looked over, one of them stood up a little bit and was giving me a bit of a stare. I grab our kid and start following my fiance, who is now booking it. As we were walking away though, she tells me that somebody is following us now. I look over and see the creepy looking shirtless dude getting into his old beige sedan behind us. My fiance explains to me that that same man kept approaching her whenever I would get up to run around with our kid. At first, he just introduced himself and tried talking to her. She thought that he was benign, but just trying to hit on her or something. But when I came back, he apparently bolted. I sat with her for a couple of minutes and then went back to play with our kid. Apparently, as soon as I went though, he returned. He asked her if she was married to me. She said that we were going to be, hoping that that would be the end of it. He goes away before I come back to sit with her again. And the third and final time I go to play with that kid, he apparently came back again. He told her that she was a beautiful lady and asked if that was her daughter, pointing to our kid. But my fiancé said yes, and the guy said that our kid was also a beautiful lady, and that his night was going to be made. Whatever that means, right? Cue when I come in and we just book it. We're walking back to our car, which is kind of far away. It was eerie in general because it was pretty abandoned outside of the park. We notice the car pull out and start driving extremely slowly in a street parallel to us. At this point, I don't think he knew that we saw him. My fiancé is freaking out and I'm telling her to wait near the closed Starbucks where we weren't in this guy's vision. We stayed there for about five minutes and I was watching the roads and I wasn't seeing anything. We continue walking but are still very much on high alert. I find my car parked outside of the McDonald's and we're now power walking to it holding our kiddo. I look behind and lo and behold... The same beige car is going at 3 miles per hour, just barely inches out from the side street so I can just see it. As my fiancé and our kid are getting in, I turn around and stare back at the car and shoot this guy the death stare. After looking at his car for about 10 seconds solid, he just peels out and speeds off past us, nearly hitting me. I'm really not sure what this guy's problem was, but if you're an eerie PA... Watch out for some scummy looking man that's about six feet tall, very wiry, possibly Hispanic, and driving a beige tan car. I assume that he wasn't tailing us for any good reason. Also, afterwards, I bring up the three guys that were staring at me, and my fiancé said that the pervert following us was sitting with them when he wasn't coming over to her, and saying some pretty creepy stuff. This is a story that my grandparents and my mum used to talk about. So at some point, my great-grandfather went to the forest to pick up some woods. Back in those days, that's what you had to do. He went there during night since it was illegal to take wood from the forest. And by chance, he met there another man from the village who was doing the same thing. They agreed to stick together. A little time passed when they saw a small billy goat. Its fur was black, and my great-grandfather assumed that someone had lost it. But they decided to take the billy goat with them in order to share its meat later. They put the billy goat in a sack, and that was when some really weird stuff started to happen. The sack became heavier and heavier, and they exchanged it often between them, as it was getting so heavy to move that it was exhausting. At some point, the billy goat was so agitated that my great-grandfather said, Take it easy, billy goat. But then, the goat repeated the same exact words in a really weird voice. My great-grandfather immediately dropped the sack, got a gun out, and shot the sack twice. But when he did, there was nothing in there but thin air. They were convinced that it was the devil since they had in mind to steal wood. I 
I usually stay up very late because I love being outside in my yard at night. But a few weeks ago, I was hanging around outside, sitting on a rock and just looking up at the sky. Everyone was completely asleep, including my pets, and I was the only person left awake, as usual. When I heard something whisper, and the strange thing was that it sounded like it was right near me. I heard the voice clearly, and I even remember how it sounded. It was raspy and feminine. It must have been speaking gibberish because I just couldn't understand it at all, even though I could clearly hear it speaking. I was frozen for a moment. I was afraid of looking anywhere, so I just kept my eyes down and waited until it stopped. It whispered for like almost three seconds, I'd say, and when it stopped, I just ran inside and didn't get out for the whole night. And a few days later, something else happened. Usually my parents lock the gate because there's a lot of creepy people lurking around in this area since it's so quiet and secluded. But I need to check on my cats a lot since they lurk around at night near the river and I'm scared of something happening. Also part of a little remaining bit of OCD that I have left. So I jumped on the wood that we used for our fireplace situated near the fence so I could look outside and see if my babies were up to something. And when I did I saw something near the river. It's dark on the street, only illuminated by the street lights, but I saw something moving through the trees, which are pretty tall, and it was really, really sudden movement. I don't even know for how long it lasted, but it felt out of this world. It felt like this shouldn't have belonged in this reality. It moved that quickly. And when I saw it, I felt the worst dread in my life that I've ever felt and I just couldn't do anything. It was kind of like a human shaped void and I couldn't really see anything else from the distance that I was at. Actually I'm not even sure how it looked like. It was like shaped a bit like a human but it looked almost wrong. Like its bones, if it even has them, were kind of twisted around. And it might have been dark outside but this thing was darker than anything else I've ever seen. There wasn't anyone else in the area and I know how a person in the dark looks so this was no person. I was shocked and I think it must have lasted for a second or two but what I know is that that thing, it shouldn't have been there. I quietly got off the wood so I didn't make a commotion and I went inside. And I must admit that it's really shaken me to my core. After that too I kept feeling just really weird and a bunch of times I felt like I was being shoved and pushed even though there's nothing there and these days I just always feel really uncomfortable here. My daughter Madison always had imaginary friends. They were always in pairs. There was Dana and Steve, Frogger and Kinga and boyfriend and girlfriend. Then one day, she told me at around age three, she's now 15, about Kellum that played with her. I thought that it was odd that this imaginary friend was flying solo, but I played along and asked if Kellum was her age. She told me that Kellum wasn't a kid, that he was a grown-up who was tall like her daddy, in wore brown pants and a yellow shirt. I still thought that we were talking about someone from her imagination, so I didn't dwell on it until one day she started singing a song that I'd never heard before. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer, do. I'm half crazy or for your love of you. And then she'd mumble a few words and pick back up with a bicycle build for two. This went on for a few days and I assumed that she'd heard it from our babysitter or something as she didn't go to daycare and that's the only other person who interacted with her at length outside of immediate family, that is. So I asked the babysitter what the actual lyrics were so I could help her sing it better. The babysitter tells me that she thought my husband and I taught her the song because she didn't know it either. I then asked my daughter where she heard the song and she tells me that Kellum taught it to me. He sings it to his baby. And this definitely gave me the creeps. But I thought it best to just chalk it up to something she heard on television rather than face what I was actually thinking. Eventually, Callum faded away and she stopped singing the song. 
she grew out of her imaginary friend phase and we never thought about Kellum again. So fast forward to about five years ago, I'm telling the story to a co-worker who actually recognised the song as an old Nat King Cole tune called Bicycle Built for Two that was popular way back in the early 20th century. Well, that prompted us to start looking on Ancestry.com at my property address history and I start following rabbit holes and found that in the 40s, the Beasley family bought the property adjacent to ours and ran a small dairy farm on it until it was sold in the 90s. And the deeded owner at the time that it was purchased in 1941 was Callum Beasley. Callum was the father of five children and his youngest died at age three and her name was Madeline. So first some information about my great grandmother, Gigi. She was born to immigrant parents in 1911 and passed away at the age of 94. Her father was an Englishman and her mother was from Luxembourg. Most of her family spoke German as well as English. However, Gigi only knew a little German. Gigi's mother only spoke German and was also almost completely deaf. So therefore, Gigi relied on either her sisters to translate the mangled German or a crude family sign language that they had developed. Gigi grew up in rural North Dakota and to frame the time period, she once told me about how when she was a little girl, her family would regularly barter with members of the Mandian tribe whom she described as real Indians, not like today. She also only attended the local school to about the sixth grade. Later in life, she was not particularly bright, but not dumb by any means. She was religious, but not a Bible thumper, the type of woman who you would give a religious birthday card to, and a Ninja Turtle action figure, who had a picture of Jesus, but just never said grace. But the one thing that she was always very serious about was how she had met the devil. Gigi would tell this story when prompted, but she never seemed to enjoy it and was always just consistent in her description. So, when she was 10 years old, she was misbehaving. Her father wasn't home and her mother, again, didn't speak English. Her mother attempted to control her, but Gigi just ignored her. Finally, her mother tried to grab a hold of her, but Gigi flailed and almost hit her mother. Gigi's mother caught her hand and looked her cold in the eyes. She let Gigi go and pointed at the closet and left the room. Now, Gigi and her siblings were often sent to the closet as a sort of time out, and she knew that she had messed up. So she went to accept her punishment, but when she opened the door, something was inside of there. Gigi said that the being had hooves and was covered in dark fur, which subsided a bit on the torso or the chest up to the face. The being had a man's face with dark eyes, an unkempt beard, and a mop of dirty black hair. And from only one side of its head rose a deer antler. Gigi said that the being stepped forward slightly before she slammed the closet door shut. She shrieked and her mother came to see what the commotion was. Gigi could only really cry and wave her arms, but my mother opened the closet door anyway, and there was nothing there. She was always very serious about that story, and admittedly writing it even now makes me feel just off somehow. But that's how the story of how my great-grandma met the devil actually went, apparently. However, she also said that aliens gave her a stroke. So a few years before she died, Gigi had a number of strokes. She was in her late 90s at the time. The first was not debilitating. It just took some time to recover. Gigi and her husband, my great-grandfather, adored fast food. They had to substance hunt during the Depression to feed their children, so they just marveled at good fast food. Great-grandpa loved McDonald's, but Gigi loved pizza, specifically Godfather's pizza. After she had mostly recovered from a stroke, my family took my great-grandparents to Godfather's as a kind of celebration thing. Being a dumb kid, I got a bunch of quarters from my dad for arcade games and pretty much ignored my great-grandparents. To this day, I really do regret not spending more time with them. But I had an odd number of quarters after the games and the restaurant had one of those little toy dispensers. The ones with the plastic egg things and I bought one with my last quarter and it was a tiny plastic alien giving a peace sign. Done with the games, I returned to the table. I was fiddling with the alien, classic grey looking and... Gigi noticed it. When I set the alien down, Gigi looked at it and inspected it closely. 
With everyone at the table, she held up the alien and looked at me and said, Them's the things that come and got me. My mum, half laughing, said, What, Grandma? Gigi repeated herself and then said that they were the reason that she was in hospital. When my grandfather, Gigi's son-in-law, told her that she was in the hospital because of a stroke, she said, Them things gave me the stroke family just sort of stopped pressing at this point and things settled down after that. Most of my family just chalked it up to a, a joke or a stroke or something. I don't buy that it was a joke. Gigi was sweet but she wasn't really a joker. Furthermore, I don't even think she knew what a grey alien was. I mean, she hadn't seen a movie since the 1950s. She didn't really watch TV and she only really read the newspaper. She mostly just did crafts and listened to music in her spare time. As for it being a stroke hallucination, well, maybe, but it's still weird, right? Anyway, those are the stories of how my great-grandmother met the devil and how space aliens gave her a stroke. So I've lived in this house for three years now. We moved in when I was 12, and also I'm a female. I never really met the man next door, just a couple of times we would see each other outside, when I would come home from school that is, and he would never say a word to me, just kind of give me a look that, quite honestly, would scare me a bit. But one thing you all should know is that I've always had an irrational fear of windows. My worst fear was to see someone's face at night, and another thing you should know is my room's layout. So, when you walk in, it has two big windows. It's a small room. One faces the house next door, which from it I could see their bathroom and they could see into my full room. My other window just faces into my backyard and I can see a bit of their backyard too. So I was 14 and it was about 9.30pm. I was coming home from the 8th grade prom and I just went to my room as quickly as possible to change out of my dress because I was so sweaty. I get into my room and I start taking off my dress until I'm just in my underwear. I was also texting my friends at the same time so I was completely distracted when something just made me look up and I saw the man in his bathroom and not a single light on us, he was just staring right at me grinning. When I realized what was going on, all I thought about doing was turning off the light and slowly sneaking into my bed and changing into my clothes. Once I did that, it took me a good 20 minutes to get up and leave. I crawled out of my bed and onto the floor and opened my door and just ran out and told my mum and she was creeped out as well. We told my father 10 minutes later who then put blinds on my window. I would see him out in the backyard a couple of nights later looking into my other window and I would just hide against the wall and then out of nowhere he just disappeared. We never really knew what happened to him too because he just up and vanished. I'll never forget that night though because it scares me to think of just how many other times he must have watched me undress or when I've come out of the shower and changed and I just never caught him until that night. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and if you would like to help me out then please go ahead and watch another video by clicking on a card on the screen. As always guys, thanks for all the love and support, and I'll see you mates in the next one.